on Giants. Mounds, Monsters, Myth and Man, or Why We Want to Be Small, by Brad Lockwood. Copyright 2010, Brad Lockwood, All Rights Reserved. Did it even matter what Cheney saw? Like increased Mather and countless clerics, even Homer, as well as giant enthusiasts and Bigfoot hunters, was he going to see whatever he wanted to see? His faith, inherent and heartfelt, may have been so true that he saw giants everywhere he went. He had made a name for himself, based in part on finding monstrous, fabulous. Titles and honors in place, Cheney had created giants in Cattaraugus County and was intent on doing the same elsewhere. Maybe more important was the impact of Cheney's findings across the newly opened interior. As tens of thousands of Americans took the Erie Canal, then traversed through Cattaraugus County and westward, how couldn't they hear accounts of giants from locals? By then it was a given. The Seneca had stories, and this antiquarian named Cheney, a doc no less, had officially published multiple scientific studies. For every homesteader passing through the region, how many tall tales did they take west with them, sprinkling and creating similar stories wherever they went, seeing giants with every mastodon bone unearthed, summoning our supposed massive ancestors from the mounds scattered along the American rivers. Paul Bunyan was a real Canadian logger who fought in a rebellion, later becoming Paul Bunyan, the American icon. Osama bin Laden is a thorn in the side of the CIA that created him, so now he needs shrinking. When creating giants, it is critical that they have both local and social connections, as well as political and religious. Believable, the best example of an invented giant is Gollum. Ahead of its time, in the Hebrew Bible, Gollum is an, quote, unformed substance, a robot or automaton. Given life, Resurrected at times by a charm or prayer, usually placed in its mouth, Gollum does the bidding of believers, protecting and defending, saving the Jews of Prague most famously. Entering literature in the 19th century, Gollum has captured the imagination of Jews and non-Jews, maybe because it is accepted that Gollum is imagined, solely a psychological security. For, when giants become real, believed, they become a burden. And Cheney's were no different. Whatever is of overall effect on the psyche and mythology of America, the antiquarian's time in Cattaraugus County would soon end. The reason for his departure will never be fully known, but he promptly left western New York in the mid-1860s, moving east, continuing to write, documenting and creating an archaeological record, adding to American folklore. More Forts and Mounds, his poetic yet defensive essay in Art Journal magazine in 1863, signaled his next adventure, Eastward Ho. Imaginative as ever, contrasting Homer's Iliad with the Iroquois, comparing ancient earthworks in America to, verbatim, quote, The Last Supper, and still beautiful in its crumbling wreck, by Leonardo da Vinci the purest creations of beauty which art ever gave, end quote. Cheney couldn't be dissuaded. So soon, another follow-up, this one on Chemung County, a project for a titan. Compiling the entire early history of the area, over 500 interviews with locals and more illustrations of interesting formations, forts and mounds throughout 1865. He knew western New York, now the rest but struggling with recurring health problems, seizures, as expressed in the Havana Journal in early 1866, the unnamed writer both celebrating Cheney and mourning that this large amount of original material has been condensed and arranged and been written under more discouraging circumstances under a state of more extreme ill health. Worse, late February of the same year, almost an obituary. Was again prostrated several weeks ago by another attack of illness, and since this last attack, he has not sufficiently recovered to be able to resume or finish the sketch. Somehow he did. Cheney's longest project thus far, almost four years of work. In 1868, 
historical sketch of the Chemung Valley, etc., was at last out. All that work and a lukewarm response. There were few giants to be found in Elmira or the Finger Lakes. Even worse, he was an outsider. Sales were slim. First disbelief followed by despair, seeking solace, support. Cheney wrote to other authors, fellow Native American lore and mound enthusiasts, hoping for their interest, maybe accolades, even an endorsement. A response from William Gilmore Sims, the successful Southern biographer, editor and author of the romantic yet stereotypical Native American novel, The Yamanzi, was hardly encouraging. Cheney had obviously requested that Sims introduce him to other authors and poets, including James Ryder Randall of Maryland, My Maryland fame and Fanny Downing, but was politely rebuked. I regret that I can give you none of the addresses of the several parties for who you inquire. Sims replied, blaming the Civil War for the loss of their addresses, as well as his own poor finances, adding, I regret that just at this time I can contribute nothing to your objects. The little time which I have to bestow upon correspondence, which, whatever the pleasure, yields me no marketable profits. Cheney was alone. He'd left Cattaraugus County, moved on to document Chemung County, taken part in dozens of excavations and interviewed hundreds, but ostracized himself in doing so. So he did what came natural. He moved again. Another book, this time to Seneca Lake, compiling and completing the early history of the region of Seneca Lake by the mid-1870s. He'd now documented the ecology, geology, and history of three counties in a matter of two decades. Certainly prolific, but with questionable personal results. He'd given himself to the search, creating giants in Cattaraugus County, but finding few elsewhere. His seizures were more frequent, still scaring onlookers, Cheney remaining possessed by the search until the end. His last gasp was the excavation on Cowan's land in 1876 an event that is shown more dubious than dependable, with Cheney's health so poor at the time that even his attendance is in doubt. Still a swan song, another big bone but not enough for another book, yet still sent to Albany with his name attached and remaining official until the 1930s. The father of one son, Lewis, and husband to Rachel, the son of a minister, prolific collector of old books and autographs, Honored antiquarian Doc T. Apollyon Cheney, LL.D., Esquire, died on Seneca Lake in 1878. Like his later works, inspired attempts to regain the popularity of his first and most successful book, Cheney may have been forgotten altogether. And then the history of Cattaraugus Co., New York, was released hardly a year later. L.H. Everett's fine biography of the county immediately unintentionally renewed interest in the antiquarian once more. A posthumous reissue of Cheney's most famous book followed, including text in the original 24 plates in 1889, inflaming enthusiasts of giants and cementing his place in history. Had L.H. Everts not quoted from Mr. Cheney and cited illustrations of the ancient monuments in western New York in his own book, would websites and bloggers still be misquoting Doc Cheney today? Would the record read different? Would it even matter? Another take his place? Overeager antiquarian or fabulist? Forget proof, whether involving giants or not, man's early origins and gods, myths. It all comes down to the individual, intangible, personal, faith. Coming up next. On Giants. I am well aware that many popular writers in describing the ancient works have been frequently misled by conflicting reports, which are always in circulation when connected with any subject that borders on the marvelous. It is here, now, that my quest for giants came to a very abrupt end. <laughs> 